Essentially, the uh, Whigs were gone in one election. They disintegrated. I mean, I don't think there but was it's, a, it's more than just a, a rise of the third Whigs, party. Though. There was a replacement of one party with the other party. There was but you could say it came from the Free Soilers and things like that. Anyway, sorry. I'm anyway, arguing too much. we disagree. Yeah. We disagree. And, and most leftists disagree. When I give a talk and I tell about the power structure, the people in the audience who identify in some way with left, they say, he's really all right. And the liberals say, hey, it goes too far. And then somebody asks a question like you asked, and the leftists say, eh, he's such a disappointment. <laughs> and the liberals say, well, maybe he's not such a bad guy. <laughs> I, I think that the uh, structure, and this is also a peak of mine. You know, all these people, all of grander leftists talk about structure. Structure. What the hell is the electoral system that ain't a structure? I mean, tell me how it's different. Who's my next uh, inquisitor? They're, hand, they're trying to hand it to you, Richard. Are they? So uh, along the same topic of strategy, but uh, one thing you haven't said is the demographic changes in a more optimistic direction, perhaps, that are happening. I mean, Obama was elected when 40, only 43% of the white population supported him. And that demographic shift toward people of color, toward women in the electorate, is a continuing trend. And uh, I don't think people on the left talk about that as much as they might. But let me add, uh, there is a important article by Harold Meyerson, the uh, very excellent journalist from right. LA, uh, in, uh, in um, the American Prospect about a third party called the, the Working People's Working Families Party in New York, which is taking account of this demographic change in a way that you might approve of. Uh, first of all, in New York State, the structural problem you're talking about doesn't exist. A third party can endorse candidates right. from other parties. And the Working People's Party endorsed, not only endorsed Bla de Blasio for mayor, they elected him. They built the ground campaign. They built the force that elected him and other candidates in the uh, New York City election. They now have a national uh, program, not to run candidates against the Democrats, but to create a national organizing force uh, that is something like the Tea Party within the Republican Party structurally, that is, uh, working for on an agenda of its own, but working uh, not against candidates where third parties would destroy them. I just want to yeah. mention that because I think the, I agree, you're much too gloomy, that's our role together as friends, uh, to sh suggest to you that dialectically there are other possibilities yeah. uh, in the world. Too much of a pause on this. Um, yeah, that, that's an old, that's the future. Maybe, maybe it'll work. Maybe some of you will decide to do that direction. Um, I've, to I've told you the history of why there's great inequality uh, in America. Um, there is this party in, in New York does have different laws than the other states. The only, only thing I'd add is the people that wanted to do the New York kind of strategy, they took a, they took a, a case went all the way to the Supreme Court to maybe make it so the, these could happen in other states. And the Supreme Court shot them down. And it finished them off 20 years ago. Uh, the same guy that's involved in this New York party. I, I, I'm not opposed to it. I wouldn't rant and rave against it. I wouldn't bet a nickel on it. But, um, but maybe it's a hope. Let's, uh, talk, let's talk intellectual here and not just political. Or, yeah, yeah. Could, could, you, uh, could you address a little bit changes inside the leadership of the labor movement Going back to this period of 39, I said, well, what's, when, once labor comes into the war, it really, well, Mills said, new man of power. I mean, there's plenty of others who had different variants of that. So there's a change from a more insurgent type of movement to, at least for a period, part of the uh, establishment in a certain sense. And so they, after the war, one argument is that because of that, they weren't really even prepared any longer to do something like a union drive in the South for example. Mm -hmm. So could, if you could just address, because it's certainly not a constant, whatever uh, yeah. those people are and, and, yeah. and are doing. I, I, I don't agree with that argument in the sense that, um, and I'm not then looking back at history and saying certain kinds of things were inevitable, I don't think, but I, I you know, it's a, then gets into a big fight of whether, you know, who, what was Ruther doing in the top guys. 
I don't know. I, th I just don't think so. I think that, that, uh, uh, that the Southern agenda was such, uh, Southern United States agenda was such, I think racism was such, that I don't think they were easily displaced. It's, it, it's, it's those bigger tectonic kind of shifts that I think will have to happen that would then lead to uh, uh, something different. Um, so I, I don't buy that particular argument for the past, but maybe it will work for the future. Uh, my, my best favorite book on this is, is, I guess, more of a liberal history book, and it's by Kevin Boyle, historian, and it's called uh, The UAW in the Heyday of American Liberalism. And his point was that you know, these were pretty strong social democrats. They certainly were trying to work in the South. They were certainly trying to do this and that. And as the union leadership did that, they more and more alienated the uh, rank and file. And the rank and file did then vote in the opposite kind of direction of what the union had hoped for. Um, so I, I think uh, there's an autonomy then to the working class in terms of what they think their priorities are. In other words, people's priorities to vote their skin or their skin color or their religion or whatever it may be, uh, their upward mobility because certainly a lot of the uh, 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 craft workers, their kids went to college and became professionals and, and white collar and management and so on. So I think th I accord them an autonomy on that and I, I don't blame the labor leaders. Um, uh, so we may be just disagreeing on, on that, but I, that, that, that's my take on it. Any other, how about some, uh, let me, okay, I'll just go to Howie, but I was going to say, geez, there must be some younger people here who want to ask some questions. But go ahead, Howie. Uh, they're not raising their hands, I don't know. I think it's because you're living in the past, uh, Bill, but it's, it's really good, it's really good to see you here, and uh, I appreciate your talk. Uh, I want you to uh, address the question of why Obama has capitulated so intensely to Wall Street why he did not stand up for the Madison Rebellion, didn't utter a peep about that, why he has uh, essentially uh, refused to subsidize in any way, shape, or form foreclosed and underwater mortgage holders while endorsing tremendous handouts to AIG, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, you know, what, what that means, especially in light of uh, Dick's question about the uh, demographic shift in the party towards uh, uh, not only a darker electorate, but a lower income electorate. Well, my one, you know, my first answer is that in a certain way, I don't, I, I don't know. Um, I do think I, I do think that Obama tends to be you know center center left. If there was a strong, if he thought there was a strong liberal contingency, he's also a politician. So I think I don't think he thinks he's got the votes on on a lot of these things, um, and I think he may well be right. But you know, one of the things I learned in doing this this book called The Myth of a Liberal Ascendancy is that it really is useful to have archival records. It really is to, uh, um, to, to have the whole background. Um, to, to know how much we're missing when we think we're watching. I thought I was watching pretty closely in the 60s and in the early 70s. And when I read this stuff, you know, I think, wow, you know, I was living more of my everyday life. I didn't read everything. I didn't keep up. I didn't have a, you know, didn't read the, the polls right or enough polls. So I think it's, it's really hard to make these contemporary analyses. That, I mean, that's been my general stance for a long time in, in terms of all of this. Um, from I mean, the Pentagon Papers, you know, we think one thing. We think we've understood the war and what's going on in Vietnam, why they're doing this and that. And then we get the Pentagon Papers, and, they, and, the, and the more you read, I've read now you know, a lot of stuff on the Vietnam War. They knew from the start. They knew from the 40s, the 50s, they could never win there. You know, and we, we didn't have a good sense of that. So, but they knew it, but we only get their papers later. Um, a, a historian who was a leftist, who's, these friends of mine that are here would know, Jimmy Weinstein, 
when I told him I'd switched over to sociology. So that's good, Bill, but if you really want to understand it, maybe you'll switch to history someday. <laughs> I remembered him saying that. I was kind of annoyed. But when I read these files and piece together uh, or read great case histories, the great history is being done by these people that do these really good case histories uh, on pieces of legislation. If you have any context, you know, as we do, you know, conservative voting coalitions and you know, spending coalitions and so on. When you read these detailed case studies and the horse trading and who was willing to do what as opposed to what they said they were willing to do, I, I just bet that the uh, Obamaites uh, figured they couldn't get a lot of those things. On the Wall Street stuff, um, I think that, they're, they're, that his, his team of people and so on were very, very close to part of it, integrated, certainly part of it. Uh, of Wall Street, and but that's not new for the you know the Democratic Party in terms of how it's looked. I mean, see, when I say to people, you, you know, there's only two choices, and the liberal labor went into the Democratic Party. That doesn't mean oh, the Democratic Party is wonderful or a piece of cake or easy to take over. There's also certainly been a whole strand of people with a lot of money that have been key to the Democrats at one particular point, and uh, you know, in people's careers and. In, in my latest Who Rules America, I have traced Obama's expending history. And it's kind of, you know, campaign finance history. And it's interesting, you know, from the local level, he was, he was financed by developers, local developers, some of them black and Hyde Park and so on. But then as he moves up, he gets better connections. And then, and then, uh, uh, then when he decided to go for president, uh, he spends a weekend with a woman named Penny Pritzker whose family uh, is hugely wealthy. And it was kind of amusing to me because we, my friend had interviewed uh, uh, her uncle 25 years earlier, and he'd named all the potential males that would run the thing. He didn't name Penny, and she ended up running it. You know, which is, again, how we miss it. The point Thomas. is, she then ran his national campaign uh, finance with connections all over the country, was seen as centrist and safe. And lots and lots of very, very wealthy people then financed him. I, I don't think he's going to go against them. Uh, I put into my last uh, uh, book a thing. I uh, was pretty careful how I put it in. But he named three or four people that were, they said, I love him. But I'm sure against him on this uh, uh, labor thing he wants to do. This was when Obama first got in office. And... Uh, they, these were all Chicago millionaires in hotel and real estate, and they didn't want, and they had financed Obama, and they, they said publicly in this you know, ethnic newspaper that they did not want this labor law. And one guy said, I'll love him anyhow, but, uh, but I'm sure opposed to this law, and I sure hope he thinks it through, and so on. So I don't think he's going to then fight very hard for that law. I think that, that's where I said, how do they rule? Partly it's through the campaign finance, but partly through, uh, I mean, the, the New York Democrat, Schumer, right? How, we ever get Schumer to go against uh, Wall Street? You know, I mean, so I, I have no illusions about that, that, uh, that kind of thing. Let's get some fresh blood in here. <laughs> Here's the person right front. I can hear him. Daniel and then Michael, please. Oh. Okay, stand up and say it a little louder, Daniel, and I'll catch you without it. Go All ahead. Right, uh, yeah, the That's what, go, go back to politics. Yeah, we'll, we'll bring it back to politics a little bit. I'm curious what your opinion about, in some ways, the retreat of the... That's okay, I don't need it. Oh, thing? Oh, oh okay. he needs it. You need it. All right. Uh, thank you. Dragging it back to politics, I'm curious what your opinions are in the sense of the retreat of paleoconservatives to, say, the Libertarian Party and your classical liberals to the Libertarian Party. The what? The conservatives? paleoconservatives and their retreat, so to speak, to the Libertarian Party. What's your opinion on that? Well, uh, uh, they were really hammered. I mean, his, his point, his question is an, an interesting one in terms of these, they're libertarians. In fact, the guy that spends the most money now, this uh, Coke guy, he was a libertarian. And he financed that whole party. And the way he was able to finance their 19 election, 1980 election was he put his brother on the ticket. And his brother was vice president candidate, so he could give, so it was, you know, family running, so that's where they had all the money. And so the Libertarians ran, and they got 1% of the vote against Reagan. And that's when this uh, uh, Coke guy started in. But don't, you better believe that all their ultra-conservative friends were beating on them and angry as hell with them. And 
So you'll get in a situation, say you're a feminist that goes with the Greens. You're going to get a lot of flack from other feminists. So you've got to be ready for that. And it's the same on the other side. If you go out there in that third party, the ultra-conservative Republicans are going to uh, uh, shun you. They're going to harass you. But the interesting thing is that this Koch guy is following the strategy that I would advocate. And as he's gone into primaries and he's challenged moderate Republicans. He's taken all their seats with he and his buddies and putting unbelievable amounts of money into those campaigns. He's having the time of his life. Incidentally, I had the strange coincidence. My, I met that guy in about 1975. Libertarians at that time, they, they hate corporations so much, the strongest libertarians. The corporations would all disappear if we had fair markets. They believe that. And so they uh, invited me to their convention. And at their convention, I, they say, we want you to have lunch with this guy. So I have lunch with, turns out to be this hugely zillionaire, powerful guy. You know, and he, he, he kind of wants to tell me his life story. And I'm, 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 I'm a little embarrassing. But his father was a John Bircher. And it, you know, it called uh, Eisenhower uh, a communist and all that. And he said, and I really was upsetting, you know, and growing up and hearing that and being criticized. And, but he said, I finally figured out, this is like father-son dynamic. He said, I finally figured out there's this core of truth in what my father's talking about, and it's libertarianism. And so it's like he was a libertarian struggling to get out of his shell. And so that's what I am. And that's why I'm financing this party. And da 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 you know. And, um, and, and furthermore, he'd been to the Bohemian, I'd just written a book on the Bohemian Grove. So he, <laughs> he said, I want you to know, I was the Bo and they had given him a copy, these libertarians had given him a copy. So he's, he said, I want you to know, he said, I, I was um, just the Bohemian Grove. I said, really? Yeah. He said, and I've read your book too. I said, yeah. yeah. And he said, I want you to know, he said, I didn't talk business there once. And then he said, but, I, but he said, I want you to know, I made some good appointments for later. And he said, that fits your theory. He's been a Bohemian now for about the last 20 years, and he's in this camp of the Bohemians with unbelievably, all of them are unbelievably rich guys. You know, so it's his trajectory from about 30 to 35 to, you know, to, to the age he is now. But they have the same thing where they get back under the tent. Uh, otherwise, they're under a lot of hassle. Right now, he's under hassle because he is fighting the Chamber of Commerce of the United States. And they, they went into Alabama and fought him in a primary. So that, that, that part of the party fight like crazy. Um, but they always then support each other. And that would be the point. You fight the liberals. If you lose, you support them. That was always our line, Dick. And so then the, you know, notice how he changed the line on. Okay, um, go ahead, anybody else? Here, here folks, um, uh, Michael Curtin, maybe this is final question. On a practical note, outside, a small reception with some drinks and so on, so we can talk a bit further. Please. Yeah. Uh, so actually, I wanted to ask you, given the structural analysis you presented, how do we look forward? Like, where would, how would one build a liberal labor coalition in an era of transnational capital, right? How, yeah. how, you know, how do we even imagine or think about the possibilities of doing that? Given that you know a lo politics was very different at the moments when the coalition had the successes it had, right? I mean, politics was much more local. Uh, media was much different then. Um, politics was national primarily in, in building the coalition. Uh, there were ways that deals could be cut um, to make things happen. Now, how do you do it now? Well, I, I, you know, obviously, I don't know, and and I do think that. You know, we got to take Dick's back your point. honorarium. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> if I'd known I was going to do p political consulting, I would have brought a different talk. I try to give a very academic historical talk, but um, I do. Th Obama's victory was in part due to this demographic shift. The problem for the Democrats is to get its potential constituency register and get them to vote. And we saw that so dramatically, 2008 to 2010. There was a huge drop in the size of the electorate. And it was all young people, people of color that dropped out. And 
the Republicans jumped more quickly on the uh, unlimited spending that just passed in early 210 of the Supreme Court, and you know, whatever it was called, Citizens United. And they then really won a lot of legislatures, including Pennsylvania, that they've been jimmied them, you know, gerrymandered them in such a way that, that, that it's really tough. Um, you, they've got to be out there, your whole constituency. And, and, of course, it's such a heterogeneous coalition. If you see the differences, even though there's differences among these Republicans, um, they, they do share a much stronger common base. Um, among them, for all their differences, than the Democratic Party as a party of outgroups, as a party of people of differing religions or no religions, uh, that with all kinds of different views on, on liberalism or leftism. Uh, so it's a very heterogeneous to put together. It's harder to hold that coalition together. And, and one of the things that brought it together was having a man of, of African-American descent Afri a man of African descent running for president, who was you know, very articulate and they, everybody could relate to in some way over his color or his life story or his, um, you know, his Harvard degree or he, you know, he's very professorial. He's a preppy. They, you know, he's got a whole preppy thing that preppies can relate to immediately. <laughs> um, so uh, he was he won one of the five richest prep schools in the country for seven years. That guy has got every bit of class oozing out of him at every minute. So you got all of that, and then you could pull out the electorate. Even there, though, when the careful election studies were done by people at Michigan, we don't necessarily have to believe them, but when they looked carefully at various kinds of cohort data and so on, the fact was that it was something like 24% of Bush voters either did not vote or voted for somebody other than a Republican, which could have been a libertarian, which would be as good as voting for Obama, or it switched. So the center still matters, I think, in, even though it's squeezed down. I think the center still matters. You've got to win some of them. Um, that is not an idea that's liked outside the mainstream. See, I have some mainstream tendencies that hold me back. And the, so that, that mattered probably in that election more than we think. But I do think this demographic thing matters, but will these people vote? The other thing about that whole thing is when people get richer, they get whiter. When, if there's discrimination goes off, people start to vote their class. There's lots of very light-skinned Mexican-Americans, for instance, and Hispanics generally, and 90% or something, uh, some usually high percent of people we, we, out here we call you know, Latinos, um, are, would say are, they're white. And so as they go up the ladder and intermarry and have more education, they're as likely to vote their class as anybody else. So I don't think that it's an automatic. Who made, who made Democrats out of Asian Americans in California were right-wing Republicans including this moderate Republican named Pete Wilson, which is before most of your time. But he starts getting in there saying, oh, what is this stuff? He wanted English only. Well, he's now messing with all the Asian American people. He, he wants tighter immigration laws. He's got all this anti-immigrant stuff, and he converted a lot of those people. Chinese Americans were not strong Democrats automatically by any matter of means uh, with their backgrounds in terms of Communist China, some of them were wealthy to begin with, or wealthy Chinese Americans that were leaders in these communities. And all of a sudden you've got now a, a big percentage of, of Asian Americans in California voting Democrat. I think, I think Republicans made, they, they said, hey, you know what, you aren't one of us, you're other. You know, in the fancier terms, they othered a, a lot of people. That was pretty dumb, and Bush understood that. You know, the Bush brothers understand that, and they say, what are you doing, bad mouthing? You know, Latino. When you're talking immigrants, you're talking now Latinos. What are you doing? You're screwing us. And Bush did win more uh, 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 Latino votes and so on. So, so these kind of dynamics are what's going to decide it. Not just the demographic shift, but whether the Democrats can make the appeal, make the reach, and whether the Republicans keep screwing up. 
One of our friends, a, a, a great black sociologist who was president of the American Sociological Association, a man named Troy Duster, he once said to me, and he says, says, said to larger audiences, he said, when Republicans get in and things look bad, he says, there's one thing that you can always count on. They will totally screw it up. They will totally make a disaster out of it, right? And so you get another chance every time they you know, make a disaster, which they're doing their war on women, their war on immigrants. You, know, you go down the line, they're going to have, you know, they think these people, are, they've just pushed off welfare and food stamps and unemployment. They think that now these people are going to try to get a job. As people start dying in the streets, they fall flopping into hospitals, you know, they're going to, they create chances for us all the time. Anyway, I don't think it's preordained. I think it uh, is a, a matter of politics. And which of your identities are you going to evoke? Gender, race, class, age, you know, whatever. Thank you very much. Bill. Um This ends on a wonderful dialectical note. Disaster is our chance, and outside is a reception. Bill, thank you very much.